is Malcolm's Meanings. The Malcolm X that we see represented in today's mass media is a Malcolm that Malcolm himself wouldn't recognize. He's portrayed today as a civil rights activist, a kind of Martin Luther King figure, except he was Muslim. In a sense, popular culture has softened his image and burnished his rawness. Malcolm wouldn't recognize this new Malcolm. To listen to Malcolm or to read his speeches is to find a man who was a revolutionary. He called himself a human rights activist because he had little trust that the U.S. government would fairly protect the rights of black folks. He was a black nationalist who was also an internationalist, in essence, a pan-Africanist. During his years as a hard-working minister in the Nation of Islam, he was a bitter critic of civil rights leaders who struggled for integration. In his defense, he said, it is not integration that Negroes in America want, it is human dignity. To be sure, integration was a means, not an end. And as we survey today's landscape broadly, we must admit that millions of black folks live in or go to school in communities and institutions that are economically and structurally segregated 40 years later. Malcolm moves many today because of his extraordinary integrity and his determination to learn, to grow, to develop. What touches many young people is Malcolm's rise from hustler and prisoner to minister and later spokesman for an emerging revolutionary movement. Malcolm had a tremendous impact on Huey P. Newton, founder of the Black Panther Party. In fact, Newton later wrote, he would have joined the Nation of Islam, except as a son of a preacher, he tired of religion. Many of us like to try to minimize Malcolm's years in prison, yet these were truly formative years which shaped him in ways that affected the rest of his life. Once, while in prison, Malcolm and other prisoner debaters held a debate against students of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, on the issue of the death penalty. Malcolm was leader of the prison debating team and beat MIT by arguing that while English authorities were hanging people for stealing, English pickpockets were hard at work on the crowd, stealing. His years of hard work and study while in prison prepared him for an extraordinary career as a minister and movement leader. It is precisely this role that made him a target of the state. One need only read Claiborne Carson's book, Malcolm X, The FBI File, published in 1991 by Carolyn Graff, to see how the FBI shadowed Malcolm X from place to place, from day to day, for years. They even record his trips abroad, like his lecture at Oxford Union, where he denounced U.S. domestic policy. The file showed Malcolm's speech earned long applause. But there is an even more foreboding memo. On February 21st, 1965, the day of his assassination, the Malcolm X file reflects a conversation between a reporter for the now-defunct magazine Life and an unnamed person in Washington, D.C. During this conversation, one told the other that it was believed that Malcolm's killers were imported to New York from elsewhere. One person advised to the other that they should check out Washington and the CIA because Malcolm snafooed U.S. relations with African nations. If anything, Malcolm X became a bigger presence in black life in death than before. It's been 42 years since his assassination. He's as alive today as he was on February 20th, 1965. From Death Row, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are produced by Noel Hanrahan for Prison Radio. The Sons of Malcolm. It has been almost 40 years since the assassination of Malcolm X, and the influence of the black nationalist leader continues to grow, particularly among generations that were not alive when he was in the thick of his advocacy. While some of this is no doubt due to the powerful film done by the black filmmaker Spike Lee, it's also true that the writings of Malcolm X continue to be read, as does the popular autobiography penned by the late Alex Haley. One particularly remarkable example of the continuing influence of Malcolm X may be seen in the recent case of the young man John Walker Lynn, who came to be known derisively as Johnny Taliban. Lynn, who converted to Islam and went to live and fight among the Taliban government in Afghanistan, traced his Islamization to his reading of the Alex Haley work. Among the so-called hip-hop generation, too, the imagery of Malcolm, as shown by the reproduction of photos of the slain leader adorning some rap albums, 
or imitations of famous poses adopted by some rappers as covers for their own albums can be seen. Students of the Black Panther Party should know that the organization perceived itself in its earliest days as a realization of the deeply held dreams of the late Muslim leader. BPP founder Huey P. Newton would later write, quote, Although Malcolm's program for the organization of Afro-American unity was never put into operation, he has made it clear that blacks ought to arm. Malcolm's influence was ever-present. We continue to believe that the Black Panther Party exists in the spirit of Malcolm, ever-present, unquote. Today, as Malcolm's life is performed on screen by the brilliant Denzel Washington, and the U.S. Postal Service has even issued a stamp in his honor, much of Malcolm's experience as a dissident is lost in time's translation. The government that now speaks his name with praise once saw him as its greatest threat. Everywhere Malcolm spoke, there too were the spooks from the FBI, writing down notes or taping his speeches. Although they labeled him as a hate monger, it was clear that it was the government that used its awesome powers to act on their hatred against black Americans, and particularly those black leaders and spokespersons who opposed the repressive status quo. Consider the tone of his FBI file of March 13, 1963, which records his speech in Charlotte, North Carolina. Quote, Hearing the actual speech of Malcolm X enables the listener to discover the type of argument and logic employed by a hate peddler. The resulting effect is clearly heard in the background of this particular tape, Bureau Deletion. The listener can hear audience reaction in the background as Malcolm X stimulates his listeners to the release of their prejudices, grievances, and wishes. Some of the content of the tape underlines the inhibitions and repressed attitudes of a segment of Negroes in general and of Charlotte Negroes in particular. These bitternesses are easily identified on the tape through crowd outbursts as Malcolm X underlines some of the causes of Negro unrest. This tape speech, Bureau Deletion, shows clearly how Malcolm X unites the individuals into an emotional entity, how he achieves rapport, reaches common understanding and responsiveness as he fuses individuals into a unit. He continually throws irritants into an atmosphere of growing disapproval of the white race. Malcolm X uses his skill as a speaker to direct emotions and hatreds of his audience toward white people whom he sets up as a scapegoat for Negroes, described by him as a people severed from their racial heritage, unquote. That's from the book Malcolm X, The FBI File, by Claiborne Carson. Lest anyone dare to suggest that Malcolm's nationalist ideas were the reasons for this official attack on him, we are reminded that this same agency, less than six months later, would, in the words of the deputy director and one-time heir apparent to Hoover, William Sullivan, mark the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as, quote, the most dangerous Negro in the future of this nation, unquote. That's from Ward Churchill and Jim Vanderwall's The COINTELPRO Papers. Was King, too, a hate peddler? Hardly. Both Messrs. X and King were organizers of their people. They were thus deemed enemies of the state, and every phone call, every letter, every room they frequented was under the electronic and human eyes of U.S. government spies. The issue wasn't either of these men. It was the black movement. Because the FBI was concerned about preserving white supremacy, anyone who wanted to organize black people to resist their repression was deemed an enemy and targeted for their political actions and ideological beliefs. It's good to remember Malcolm for the positive lessons that continues to radiate from his life. It is also good to remember that this government opposed him and his colleagues, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, for example, using every resource, fair and foul, to destroy them and their movements. Next time you see a stamp, remember. From Death Row, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are produced by Noel Hanrahan for Prison Radio.